system recording. Okay. And I'm going to spotlight you. And then I will spotlight us uh, uh, as the questions um, emerge. So here you are. Thank you for joining us. And uh, because I'm recording, I'm going to, and then we will make a YouTube or something of that. So I'm just going to read out your bio, even though everybody knows. Uh, <laughs> No. Okay, so welcome Jumana Haddad, who is an award-winning Lebanese author, journalist, and a human rights activist. Uh, Jumana was the cultural editor of Annahar newspaper for many years and now hosts a TV show focusing on human rights issues in the Arab world. Uh, she has received the Blue Metropolis Arab Literary Prize and the Arab Press Prize, among other honors, um, and was named one of the world's 100 most powerful Arab women for four years in a row by Arabian Business Magazine. Uh, her works have been translated, published around the world, and they include I Kill Shahrazade, uh, Superman is an Arab, and The Third Sex. Book of Queens is her uh, novel and has already been translated into French, Italian, and Arabic. Uh, and here we are giving you a warm welcome from your US uh, readers, and it's being published by uh, Interlink Books in the United States. Welcome. Uh, it's, a, it's a very pretty day here in the US, uh, but we've been passionately sitting here online talking about your book. So I'm going to take the questions to our audience soon, but let me start with the first um, question, which is uh, that, I mean, first of all, we all agree that this is a really captivating and powerful uh, book. And then as I was reading it, I suspected uh, that it may be about, you know, your family or your life or your heritage. But then I wasn't sure until the epilogue came up that you draw a lot from your uh, family history. Do you want to start by telling us like the line between fiction and real life? How much is, you know, how much of it is real? How much of it is, you know, heavily fictionalized? Well, I, I suppose, first of all, thank you so much for this. I'm really very happy and honored that I'm uh, sharing uh, these moments with you and that you took the time to read the book and discuss it. Um, thank you. And uh, thank you to my publisher, uh, uh, Interlink Books, and to Rana Asfour, who's also here from the Marcas. So um, regarding your question, uh, I suppose this uh, is different depending on each author. Personally, I've always, even in my essays, even in my nonfiction, I've always uh, found uh, that I needed to explore into myself in order to be able to write, in order to be able to uh, convey a certain message. With this book in particular, with the Book of Queens, it was um, more important than ever for me to write this story as a semi, semi, uh, biographical memoir, because um, first of all, this is, I guess, the book that I have always wanted to write ever since I started writing. This is the book, I, I truly believe this is the book I was meant to write. Um, and uh, mm. it had um, so much, um, uh, I had so much fear uh, from expressing what I finally managed to express at uh, uh, 47 or 40 years um, of age uh, that I needed, first of all, the help of fiction as a support, mm -hmm. as, as a creative uh, outlet for me. Plus, uh, I didn't have enough information, especially regarding the story of my grandmother, mm. uh, because, uh, because of the way she ended her life and everything she went through. Until now, whenever I ask uh, my mother about her, she, there's there's no um, uh, there are no information. I get only you know uh, very um, vague. Um, uh, vague uh, um, impressions, if you want to know. She doesn't want to talk about it, and, and yeah. I respect pain. It's out of pain, I'm sure. So um, to me, there are no lines. I mean, it's so interlinked. It's so intricate, fiction and 
uh, reality or fiction and experience or fiction and nonfiction that I don't even ask myself the question when I'm writing. I just write. And sometimes what I've written is an essay or a poem or a play or uh, a novel like with this book, but uh, I never decide ahead. And it's always um, holds a big part of truth in it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thank you. Uh, most, uh, I, my sense is that most writers try to say, no, 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 only a little of it is from my life. Everything is fictionalized, but you're being very open about the intensity of the blurring, uh, which is which is great. Uh, I know Meg has a question and I'm gonna quickly spotlight uh, her. Hello, thank you so Hi. much. Thank <laughs> you. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask, for you to talk a little bit about the title, which we talked about very briefly at the beginning of this uh, club and someone, I can't remember now who had this idea of the, the cue, which of course is so reoccurring in the, um, in the text as a, as a kind of formal symbolism in some way of the Ouroboros or something that, that or circularity. We were talking a lot about, um, you know, repetitions and and the end of the novel, the violence kind of coming back around. So whether, I don't know, Queen has meaning um, in, in that in that kind of very formal way or also the, you know, the playing cards, all of that. So just where I'm curious to hear you talk more about the, uh, the yes. tale. You know what, Meg? It's amazing to see how sometimes readers make you discover things that you didn't have in mind. <laughs> so I'm loving this idea about, you know, the circle, because in fact, the book is uh, is a circle. So um, and I talk about it in the, in the uh, last chapter. But no, this was not um, um, uh, the reason why uh, it is called the Book of Queens. Um, uh, there are more than one reason uh, for this. First of all, um, um, I always have uh, this, um, uh, I mean, this memory from my childhood. Whenever uh, there was a new episode of war and fighting, we would go um, downstairs and our parents and our neighbors would play cards together. And I remember that uh, we used to watch them as kids. Me, my brother, the other kids, we used to watch them tease each other and play. And it always infuriated me uh, the fact that um, the king card was stronger than the queen card. And I, ever since I was seven or eight, it was like, why, why, the, why does the king beat the queen? They're both, you know, they should be equal. So uh, when I started writing um, uh, the Book of Queens, uh, I, I don't know why the image, because I had in mind four characters, four main characters over 100 years with four uh, backstories of, of um, war and, and uh, loss and suffering, but also lots of love and, uh, and, and life in the book. I thought that each one of these women who has uh, suffered and went through hell in order to be able to just survive sometimes, but also live what she wanted to live. And life kept you know, throwing uh, rocks at her, throwing obstacles at her. Each one of these women uh, to me is a queen, um, a queen in the, in the um, uh, heroic sense of the word. Uh, mm -hmm. These are heroines. Uh, so I, I, uh, I thought that the best way to, um, uh, first my thought was to choose four queens from the mythology and give them their names. And then I immediately, and I don't know why, remembered this uh, memory from my childhood. And I thought, why don't I use these four queens who have been beaten all their life by patriarchy and by war and by religion and by hate and by different forms of discrimination. Why don't I make this also uh, an ode to these, um, to these women, to these symbols, to these queens? And this is how the, uh, the idea was, uh, yeah. was material. 
in my head. And that's the reason why I chose names that started with, uh, with Q for them. Yeah. And the cover turned out so beautiful with the, yeah. from the cards. I love, I love the, the cover. I, yeah. I, I cannot wait. You know, I, I still haven't uh, seen oh. the book. Oh. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm dying to hold it in my hands. It's like a baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so does someone uh, have a question or because I have a long list? Have yeah, go ahead, Leila. I'm going to oh. add you. Okay. Um, we, uh, during our uh, conversation before you logged on, we, we discussed how we learned um, new information about the Armenian genocide and displacement. And um, so I'm wondering, um, uh, have you, what type of response have you had from, from others in the Armenian community, you know, either in the Middle East or diaspora? And, um, oh, I forgot my other question now. Um, it's fine, I can answer yeah. the first one yeah, while yeah. you might answer the other one. <laughs> So, uh, Leila, um, I'm so happy to say that the book um, has been translated to Armenian and published recently oh. in Armenian. Yes, it appeared specifically on 24 April 2022. And 24 April is the uh, anniversary of the genocide. This was the 100 and uh, I, I believe the 120 um, uh, 20th or 22nd anniversary. I'm not good at math, but it was important for me um, to, uh, to, to, to have it born in, in the language I wish I could write it into. Um, so um, those who have read it in, in Arabic who are bilingual, because they, there's a big community, uh, Armenian community in Lebanon, uh, Lebanese Armenians, and some of them do speak both Arabic and, and Armenian and read, or French and Armenian. Those who have managed to read it in those languages um, uh, were definitely um, very moved by the book, but uh, now I'm receiving the um, the feedback from Armenians who are reading it in Armenian, and um, I believe that one of the best feedbacks was by the translator of the book. She's an amazing uh, lady, a professor, a translator of many um, amazing novels uh, that are related uh, to the Armenian genocide or that discuss the Armenian genocide. And um, uh, she, uh, the love she, uh, she has for the book is, to me, is one of the most important things because I uh, didn't want just to tell a story. I wanted uh, people to, um, I wanted to share a feeling. I wanted to share uh, um, a heartbeat. I wanted, I wanted the, the readers to, uh, without any drama, I repeat, because I, I didn't want it to, uh, um, to be over dramatic uh, or cheesy, but I did want to convey this, um, um, what I have held inside of me for uh, 40 years. I say 40 years because when my grandmother committed suicide, I was seven. And when I started writing the book, I was um, 46, 47, I guess. So uh, I've held those feelings inside of me uh, until they became a volcano over time. You know, they build up to become a volcano. And then when the volcano erupted, I wanted uh, to uh, share uh, this um, lava with every everyone else who was reading it. And I realized um, via um, uh, the uh, experience that my translator uh, uh, told me about while she was translating and the readers who are now, the Armenian readers who are now reading it, that, um, um, that I managed to do that. And I'm very humbled by this. Leila, you remembered your second question? Well, or yeah, the, the second was just, um, this is, this is the first book I have read um, on the, you know, a fictional account. Um, yeah. And are there others or, uh, I'm sure there are, um, but is, are there more, is there more literature available in Arabic or Armenian than in English? 
Yes, there's an amazing book that actually uh, I'm going to show it to you, uh, Leila. It's right here. It just arrived because my translator by Dick Eladjian uh, translated the, this book also into Armenian. It's called Black Dog of Fate by actually an American Armenian writer uh, called um, Peter Balakian. And she told me that I needed to read this book because it's, um, it's also um, a beautiful um, you know, testimony about uh, the Armenian genocide. It's a novel. It's also fiction and a mixture of fiction and nonfiction. So I would definitely recommend it. I'm going to start it soon, but uh, I trust her, uh, her opinion. So I would recommend reading this book. Thank you. I'll bookmark that. Thank you. Uh, Anne uh, has a question. Hear you. I, uh, first of all, I, I, I bow to you. This book is an important book, and you were brave to say what you said. And um, I, I'm humbled by your words. Um, since there are not going to be any more uh, women with the name of Q, and if I see that as a metaphor for today's uh, woman, um, what what do you think our 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 job is our plight or not our plight it's our job uh, how how are we to go forward i mean uh, violence as you say has uh, been idolized we idolized war heroes and so what what do you say to go beyond this book it's a very tough question because unfortunately, Anne, I feel that we are going backwards instead of moving forward. This is a very um, complicated and uh, tough time for humanity and for human beings, especially those who are in a vulnerable position. Uh, there is a lot of discrimination, a lot of hatred, um, a lot of um, uh, bigotry and bias. Uh, opinions about the other. Um, so I believe that the most important thing to do, um, and and uh, I usually um, carry this around uh, via um, uh, two uh, very strong feelings. Um, the most important thing to do is to keep on fighting every day, not losing hope, not surrendering uh, to the illusion that uh, there is uh, enough justice out there because there isn't still enough justice out there. There's so much injustice uh, being perpetrated in so many different forms. I'm not only talking about uh, gender violence or gender inequality, so many other different forms of, of violence, whether uh, physical or psychological or moral or verbal violence. I mean, it's like people... I, I, I sometimes uh, feel amazed by um, the uh, ability of certain people to invest their energy in hate and, and uh, abuse instead of investing it in, in doing beautiful things and uh, living a happy life. I was talking about the two feelings I personally use in order to uh, draw the, uh, uh, I'm going to say, the strength to keep moving forward and not losing hope. And, and these two feelings are anger mm -hmm. by, and by anger, I mean outrage, uh, outrage uh, at, um, at what's happening, not only in the Arab world, but everywhere in the world. Um, I feel like people are lacking uh, anger nowadays there's so much indifference um many people without generalizing are trying to protect themselves and be in their own bubbles and i do understand this need to 
uh, be protected, to shield yourself from uh, a harsh uh, world, but at the same time, uh, being involved in uh, the world around us, trying to make it a little bit, just a little bit better by influencing just our uh, direct uh, circle of, of people is a duty, not just a choice. So uh, I feel this is important. It's important for us to feel outrage whenever we see an injustice. And the other feeling that I also, uh, from, from where I draw uh, the strength to keep moving forward is love, uh, because we also need a lot of love in order to not lose hope. Love for ourselves and love for the world and love for others love for those who are weak and vulnerable and abused and um, uh, love also for um, the causes that we are defending or that we believe in. I always, I used to tell my sons, I have two grown up uh, sons, one is 30 and one is um, uh, 22. And I used to tell them all the time and I keep doing that. Even if you witness um, um, something that you feel uh, is an injustice, but you wouldn't consider to be, you know, uh, something important or big or on a big scale, do something about it because this is how we change the world. It's not uh, by, uh, you know, necessarily by taking down the streets and doing huge revolutions and. Uh, you know, uh, being involved in, in big fights. It's also, and most importantly, by these small steps that we learn uh, to take on a daily basis in order to never be silent uh, if we ever witness any form of injustice or discrimination mm -hmm. in our circle of people. Yeah, yeah, that's thank you. Um, just one quick, um, we're, thank you so, so much for that. Were you influenced by Homer in writing this book? No. <laughs> I wish I could say yes, no. <laughs> but thank you, that's, that's a big compliment. <laughs> Yeah, we were wondering, we were talking, we were thinking about the Greek mythology that weaves in and out, uh, the reference to Medea, and then there was a, another Greek reference that we couldn't uh, recall, but it was fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I, to follow up on what, um, uh, what Anne was uh, saying, uh, you know, you've spoken before about, and let me just push back a little bit to some of the stuff you're saying, right, about love and uh, about uh, using anger and outrage in particular ways. Uh, you've said many times uh, uh, in your public, uh, you have a huge public uh, kind of persona, you know, politically and uh, as a journalist and so on. Uh, you've said you're a feminist uh, and, uh, you know, you're an atheist and all. Uh, there are all these ways in which you um, engage feminism. I wondered for, for example, what you thought was the sort of feminism being propagated by Book of Queens. Uh, first, it was very clear to me, it felt like it was about survival, building worlds despite trauma, you know, um, uh, pushing forward, uh, extreme courage. But then when Kamar, does what she does. I just, I couldn't cope with it. <laughs> I know you were talking about the circularity, but then I felt like this ending felt so hopeless. Like, where is the feminist survival? Like, what are we going to do? You know? So I just wondered like how you were conceiving of a kind of feminist approach in this book or what these women were propagating. Uh, Kamar, Kamar's uh, decision, um, I don't know if it was a decision. I think it was a reaction. Uh, but anyway, uh, what, what Kamar did um, was in a way, and I discovered that afterwards, you know, I'm, I'm like everyone else. I receive uh, the, um, um, the, the, the waves, uh, the shock waves of what I write after I write it and not in advance. It's not, it's not, it's not there on purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I felt like um, to me, uh, this was like an alarm, sounding an alarm, you know, because I do, and I've, 
I've read so many stories like uh, Kamar's story, unfortunately. You know, women who come from uh, aware uh, backgrounds, uh, uh, cultivated, uh, uh, you know, exposed to the world and who do stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't understand where was this coming from. And I was trying to make peace with it. And to me, like you said, it's also... Um, uh, maddening this, 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 you know, this loop, this never ending loop. But if you think about it, we are in a loop still, you know, whenever uh, there is, there is a, um, uh, a win for us feminists, uh, there's also some, some kind of a setback. Um, so it's even in countries that are, uh, that who who would be inclined to consider themselves done with this fight? Mm -hmm. Like, let's say um, I'm gonna say the Scandinavian countries. You yes. cannot imagine how many messages I get from women uh, who are Norwegian or Danish or Swedish uh, who tell me that uh, the patriarchy is still alive. I mean, of course, these are countries that have set in place amazing laws, amazing systems in order to uh, protect and support and respect equality. But then again, uh, it's like there's this monster uh, lurking, waiting to just push back all the time. And um, I don't mean to be a negative or pessimistic because I'm a fighter and fighters are always optimistic you know or else why fight you know we fight because we believe we're gonna we're gonna win at the end of the day but there is a lesson to learn from what is happening uh and from Kamar's story uh and it's about never uh uh you know um feeling that um the things that we have managed to achieve as women all over the world um, shouldn't be taken for granted. We shouldn't take them for granted. We shouldn't believe that uh, what we uh, gained has been gained forever. It will always be uh, challenged. It will always be threatened. And we have the obligation to be uh, lucid and aware and attentive at all times in order to keep pushing yeah. forward. Yeah, yeah. No, no. And of course, the, the literary critic in me understands why it had to end that way, because actually, if you think about the intergenerational trauma and the transmission of the trauma, suicide is there already in that family, you know, so yeah. one sees why, why, that, why that ends up that way. Uh, who has more questions or I can keep asking? Rana, did I, you have I, something? I, it's, it's Mayor. Hi, Mayor. Go ahead. I, I have, um, I have uh, one's a very, um, the question that I have, first of all, thank you for the book. I thought it was amazing. I think it's so brave that you were willing to. Thank you so uh, much. Get to the, the root of this is, I'm sure it was a pretty significant psychological journey for you to, cause you witnessed some crazy things. I also just had a realization it was so brave of you to give it to a translator. <laughs> it's like gonna make me cry. Because you gave it to a translator, you're running the risk that that translator is going to judge your work. And she did in yeah. a good way, but that was kind of interesting. Yeah. I never thought about that. Um, the question I have is, I thought, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the cue names perfectly, but the oh, second generation I thought was going to be the next suit of cards. Yes. And because there was four generations, what was that a, a purposeful choice to just represent two suits? No, it's four suits. So there's four suits. But I only, I, maybe, it was the, maybe it was the copy that I had. It only had diamonds and hearts. I know, there are four. The four queens are represented. Each queen. Okay, so it does. Okay, so I, okay. I, for some reason, I didn't get that. But you did. It was, I thought maybe you were setting yourself up for a sequel. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm done with that book. You know uh, what, Mayor? I tried to. <laughs> Uh, you know what they say that um, sometimes uh, by writing you uh, exercise your demons. Uh, you actually don't. They're still inside. But in a way, I feel 
a little bit lighter and there's a certain feeling of, um, I'm going to say between, uh, you know, uh, 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 there's a feeling of revenge. Um, revenge in the beautiful sense of the mm -hmm. word. Um, trying to um, uh, take back uh, some form of justice via one of the most beautiful tools that I believe exists in the world and that's literature. So um, I, I'm, that book is over, there's no sequel, but. <laughs> well, I do, think, I do think that the beauty in the book is your, your writing, your writing's spectacular. It, it, you really have the ability to weave the words in a way that you're telling a difficult story, but it's, it's quite it's very beautifully done. So thank you for that. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, another question? Rana, you had something? Yeah. No, I just want to say, um, of course, I Hi, just Jumana. want to add, Hi, Jumana, how are you? I just wanted to add to everybody's comments that it was, it was a beautifully written book, absolutely. And we were discussing before you came on about the, uh, the violence, the writing about the violence in the book. Mm. And we were discussing what you know, whether it was a lot of violence, whether the violence is necessary, and we decided that sometimes it is necessary to have the violence in there. My question to you is how, for us, or for myself personally, some parts are really difficult, especially with the, you know, with the things that were happening through the eyes of the children, but also how difficult was it for you to write it? And how much of it did you take away and leave into the book from the initial writing? And thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you, Rana. Um, obviously, it was very difficult, and this is why it took me so many years, almost four decades, uh, in order to be ready to write the story. Um, um, I've written a lot about suicide before. I've always been obsessed with suicide and with uh, the way uh, trauma is um, also um, inherited from one generation to another, even if you haven't witnessed anything related to that trauma. Uh, but I mean, as a Lebanese woman, I've witnessed my own shares of trauma. So uh, uh, my own share of trauma. So they all added up one on the other. Um, it's been difficult, but at the same time, um, it was a necessary challenge for me because I felt like, just like I say in the last chapter, I felt a very weird urgency to just write it down. And I want it because I'm, I'm, um, um, uh, I like what you said about the violence. Uh, you know that um, many readers told me uh, that at some point they had to leave the book a little bit and take a breath, uh, of sometimes for a few hours, sometimes for a few days, uh, because they couldn't handle um, the amount, not necessarily of violence, but of the pain that this violence recreates in you, you know, because this is what's, uh, because if you're empathetic and if you're a good reader, you are bound to feel what the writer is talking about. You feel it in your, in your flesh, you feel it in your heart, you feel it in your conscience. So, um, and I do understand that, that kind of reaction. Uh, but to me, I wrote it like, um, I don't know how to say it. I wrote it like, um, 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 you know, I was in a frenzy, Rana. I, I wouldn't sleep. Uh, I wouldn't eat. I just would write and write and write. I didn't take any uh, hours off or days off. I became obsessed with finishing this book because I felt that if I stopped to take uh, uh, a breath of air, I might stop forever. That, that's how hard it was. And I needed to get it out there. I needed to get it out of me and I needed to, for it to exist, to be out there in the world. So yeah, it's, it's very hard, but that's also a lesson in, uh, in, in, in writing because it, there's always some kind of war going on inside whenever, I mean, at least for me, whenever I'm writing, there's, because it's, as if the words are resisting me and the story is resisting me and I have to, you know, force it to get out. And it's always like that, but with this book in particular, it was the hardest confrontation of all. Wow. 
<laughs> That's Thank extraordinary. You. Thank you for bringing it out. So well done. <laughs> Is there another question from the audience or I have one? Okay, uh, I will ask. So uh, I just wanted to talk a bit about Beirut. Clearly you, you know, the city is beloved to Qadar and it's beautifully uh, depicted. Uh, and I think I know, I have spent some time in uh, Beirut to know the neighborhood I think that you're referring to. Um, but also, you know, when I was in, when I was visiting Lebanon, I then visited Syria. So when I went to Aleppo, I was staying in the Armenian uh, uh, neighborhood. Yeah, and you know, all the food there was like Armenian, this, that, and I will have to say that that was not my experience of Beirut. And I wondered like the difference between, this is of course now, all these places are destroyed by yet another war in Syria in particular. But I just wondered about the experience of being Armenian in Lebanon or how is the culture kind of kept alive? I mean, do you feel like it's a, it's a uh, welcoming place for Armenian diaspora? Just some thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely a welcoming place. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Armenians uh, uh, have also a strong belonging to Lebanon. I don't know about the Armenians in Aleppo, mm -hmm. uh, but um, they are not a closed community. They have, um, you know, there's a there's a lot of um, interaction between the two cultures and they learned a lot from each other. Um, I have to say that the experience of Armenians in, in Lebanon is one of the most successful regarding regarding um, uh, regarding uh, people who uh, uh, migrate because of war uh, or uh, who have to uh, seek refuge in another country. Uh, it's like it's like a home to to Armenians, and I don't think that. Um, you would find um, an Armenian who would say I'm an Armenian without saying I'm a Lebanese Armenian or I'm an Armenian Lebanese. So this is, I can only talk about the experience of Lebanon. Uh, I grew up in the Armenian neighborhood. Um, it's not only Armenian. It's, it okay. has a lot of non-Armenians as well, uh, but there is a majority of Armenians. And I have to say, I like this. I don't like it when neighborhoods are homogeneous and it's like recreating a small uh, uh, yeah. a country inside the country. It's beautiful to interact. I mean, this is, this is how I see it because it's, it's an exchange of experiences and cultures and and uh, uh, ideas, and it enriches both cultures. You know, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that us Lebanese are richer because of the Armenians, and that us Armenians, because I'm half half or a quarter, uh, whatever. I'm I'm a huge mix of things. Uh, also, we are uh, richer because the interaction with the Lebanese culture. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jumana. I'm going to let you go on that note. Uh, it's been a joy. Thank you for writing this incredible so book. And we we wish you. it an exciting journey. Lots of thank reviews, lots of sales. And I'm thank very you so grateful. Much. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you so you. much. Bye. Bye.